I want to begin this morning by uh, <clears throat> inviting you to turn with me to a passage in the book of Esther. Esther, chapter 4, verses 14 to 16. It's Nehemiah, Esther, Job. Those are, it's a little book. Nehemiah chapter 4, verses 14 to 16. You all probably know the story. I'm just going to read a part of that little story. Verse 14. If you have it, say amen. We all have it. Nehemiah 4. I mean, Esther 4, 14 to 16. Amen. Amen. Okay. For if you all together hold your peace at this time, then shall their enlargement and deliverance arise to the Jews from another place. But you and your father's house shall be destroyed. And who knows whether you are come to the kingdom for such a time as this. Then Esther bid them return. Mordecai this answer. Go gather your Go gather together all the Jews that are present in Shushan and fast you for me. Neither eat nor drink three days, night or day. And I also and my, and my maidens will fast likewise. And so will I go to the, into the king, which is not according to the law. And if I perish, I perish. So Mordecai went his way, did according to all that the and did according to all that Esther had commanded him. Wow, what a story. It was a fearful time for the Jews. A decree had been made in Persia that all the Jews would, it was genocide for the Jews. All the Jews were to be destroyed. And um, Esther came to the kingdom for such a time as that. For such a time as this. You know, as I visit with people, not only Adventists, but uh, people in general. I'm per impressed that the time has come for a renewed interest in the studying the prophecies of Daniel and Revelation. Do you sense that? In the near future, and even now, incredible, th in incredible things are going to happen. A totally messed up environment will sweep the planet. You can read about that in Revelation chapter 8. Terrifying sights in the heavens, along with false revival, even fire from heaven. And Matthew 24, Luke verse 21, and Revelation chapter 13, all bespeak of the things that we're mentioning here. Satan himself will appear as an angel of light. 2 Corinthians 11 verse 4, 14, I'm sorry. And the final movements will be rapid ones. Romans chapter 9, verse 28. I don't know what all that means, do you? The final movements will be rapid ones. Uh, Brett talked about how rapidly things are going. As we get older, we, we notice that. Such a short work that many will not have time to pre prepare as the precious golden oil runs low in the lamps of even true believers. All ten of the virgins in the parable of the ten virgins were believers, right? But only ten of them, only five of them had enough of the precious oil to be prepared for what was coming. So uh, the love of many will grow cold, it says. That's why it's incredibly important to prepare ourselves so that the day of the Lord does not come upon us like a thief in the night, like a tremendous surprise. At such a time as this, what should be our attitude and our commitment to God and his word, especially as we begin a new year? Do you know we've all come to the kingdom for such a time as this? Amen. To those who have believed the Lord Jesus, much responsibility has been given to us. Some have read these things and decided to head for the hills. I've known people like that who read these things and become convinced of it. They head for the hills. They sequestered themselves like monks back in, in, the, in, the, in the mountains, storing away food, and like Jonah, wait for the fireworks to fall. But is that what God wants us to do?
What should be our response? What should, be the, what should the study of prophecy do for us? Should it fill us with fear? The prophecies are the testimony of Jesus, right? There's no fear in his presence. In thy presence is the fullness of joy. At thy right hand are pleasures for what? Evermore, evermore. We're talking about eternal life here. Fear is not the goal here. Fear inca incapacitates people. It makes them feel guilty. It causes people to run away and hide. But prophecy is the testimony of Jesus. Revelation 19.10 Blessed is he that readeth, and they that hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written therein. It's a beatitude. It says blessed are they. Blessed means happy. Happy are they who read and who observe the things that are written. That's Revelation 1 verse 3. Anything about Jesus brings happiness and joy. Prophecy is designed to motivate us to a sense of urgency. Confident that the gospel is good news. And uh, the hour of God's judgment is good news for every believer in Jesus. We talk about the hour of God's judgment has come. It's in the first angel's message, right? That final message just before Jesus comes. Good news for believers in Jesus. It should cause us to pray for the latter rain in the time of the latter rain. That's a quote from Zechariah 10, verse 1. Pray for the rain in the time of the latter rain. It should cause us to pray for a close connection between Christ and us, between the mind and the heart. I'd like to have you turn with me to John, chapter 6, verses 28 and 29. John chapter 6, 28 and 29. We believe from the Bible that salvation, that acceptance with God comes by grace, right? Through faith. Plus nothing, right? We are, we are all the the people who are upon whom the mercy of God has bestowed. And uh, grace is simply the sheer mercy of God. Notice here what our work should be at this point. John chapter 6, 28 and 29. It says, Then he said unto them, What shall we do? That we work the works of God. And Jesus answered and said to them, This is the work of God that you believe on him whom he has sent. That's the work of God. Believe. Believe on him. The work, this work, that work is not finished. God is not finished with us yet. People drive past our church on Sabbath morning. They see the parking lots full. And uh, lots of cars. A monument to the Christian Sabbath, indeed. I'm not decrying the idea of filling up the parking lot. It's wonderful, but there's more. Revelation 12 heralds the attack and anger, anger on Christ and his church, Satan's attack. Revelation 13 describes Satan's strategy in the end time in fascinating detail. But when we get to Revelation chapter 14, wow. We have a description there of the 144,000 carrying the gospel message to the world with power. A message for every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. And God is preparing us for such a time as this. Final gospel outreach is going to take place one of these days. And when it happens, um, it's going to be uh, more than we can, than we can comprehend. Who are those angels in Revelation chapter 14? Three angels flying in the midst of heaven. Who are they? They are those who know and believe God's last end time message. The word angel simply in this passage means messenger. Messengers of hope to the people of the world. That could be us, right? Is, that, is it too far-fetched too far to think about that that way? Before our very eyes, right before our very eyes, is the conflict between the king of the north taking place right around us. Between the religious world 
and, and the godless world. There's a tremendous conflict taking place. The conflict is raging on a worldwide scale. And just as surely as the Jews in ancient Palestine experienced the ravaging armies from the north and from the south coming through their land, taking food, destroying crops, plundering the domestic animals, and in general, taking its toll on the Old Testament church. So we are living here in the end of time. And we're watching the king of the north and the king of the south. And uh, everybody around us is watching it also, right? They're all having the same experience that we are. How are we supposed to react to all of this? Jesus said, look up and realize that what? Your redemption draweth nigh. That should be a happy thought for all of us, right? Jesus said that when this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, then shall the end come. Uh, then the abomination of desolation would begin his work. And so here we are this morning. As we see the armies going through the land, everybody I talk to is in great wonder. I even got a letter from somebody here this week. <laughs> in great wonder what's going on. The nations of the world have never been so divided and rebellious. It's certainly a time of wars and rumors of wars. Do you sense that as you watch the news? Truly the forces of iniquity <clears throat> in the, are in great battle array before our very eyes. Spirit of Prophecy says, in view of all of this, all heaven is astir. Can you imagine what's going on in heaven in that great sanctuary in heaven? Angels are being dispatched to and from the earth. And uh, this time must not find God's church asleep. We need to be alert to the times that we're living in. What about the unsaved around us? The unforgiven. Who are also in the midst of this conflict right along with us. We're all in the same boat, right? Many are looking wistfully to heaven looking expectantly to God for light, the precious light. And when we see all these things, we can look, but look up and realize that our salvation is closer than when we first believed. The second coming of Christ is closer today, one day closer than it was yesterday. And we should take that seriously. We may not have a lot of time left. Recognize it as a call from God. The Bible talks about believe as the first step, Paul said to the Philippian jailer, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you what? You'll be saved and what? And your family. And the very next thing, that, that belief that was instilled in the heart of that Philippian jailer moved on to action and the whole family was baptized shortly after that. That's the main purpose for all of this, to get our attention and believe. Believe is an action word. It caused Noah to build an ark. In uh, Hebrews 11, it talks about that and to teach and preach for 120 years. It called the jailer and his wife to soon be baptized. What a testimony they had to tell about the miracle that took place in that jail cell that, that night. Middle of the night, can you imagine? Great earthquake. The things that bound them, chains that bound them were shaken loose. And um, what a miracle it was. The Bible is one gigantic prophecy that covers from cover to cover about Jesus and salvation. The Bible is primarily a book of salvation. You know, there's a lot of good science in the Bible. But it's not primarily a book on science, is it? There's a lot of good history in the Bible. I believe all that history. But it's not primarily a book about history. But the Bible is primarily a book about what? Jesus. Salvation, right? Jesus. The pages of the Bible are leaves from the tree of life. There's power in God's word. The Old Testament points backward to the creation of the world and forward to the, to the incarnation. The New Testament points us backward to the time of Christ, the incarnation and the sacrifices he made and forward to when? His second coming, okay? 
By this do you show the Lord's death until he come. We're going to have a communion service here on the 15th. Uh, I want you to all know that it's, it's, it's in the bulletin, but um, it's something to prepare for on the 15th of January. The New Testament points us forward to Christ and his coming. Do you know that over 200 times in the, in the New Testament, the, the second coming of Jesus is referred to? There should be a, an air of expectancy in the hearts of all of us as we think about that. The whole sweep of history is about Jesus. History is divided between B.C. and A.D., correct? B.C. and A.D. The Christ event actually cuts history in half. And, uh, you know, I'm a little bit amused at the idea that, that some have don't, like to, they don't like the idea that, uh, of Christ being in, involved with this. So they've come up with, with new letters. B.C.E., what does that mean? Before the common era, leave Jesus out of it, not before Christ, but before the common era. And, and uh, also, in the, in the time that we're living in, it's A, what is it? AC, after the common era, A-C-E, right. So this is our message to the world, our mission. As prophecy after prophecy is fulfilled, Lord, thank you for giving us a heads up. Amos 3, 7 says, Surely the Lord God will reveal his secrets to his servants, the prophets. He will do nothing before he does that. And so we have a heads up. When we really get it, our prayer will be, Oh Lord, hear my, send me. That's the goal of all true prophecy, to bring us into that kind of a connection. I'd like to encourage you as we go through the threshold of a new year. In prayer meeting, we're discussing the great prophecies of the Bible. Right now, we're talking about the book of Daniel. Uh, you're all invited. 7 p.m. on Wednesday evening, prayer meeting. Um, I've gotten so I don't want to miss it. And I think there's prayer meeting here also at 11 o'clock on Wednesday, right? Right in this, in this building. So uh, Doug leads out in that and... Uh, uh, you're all invited to prayer meeting midweek. That's a great time when we can all come to church again and be refreshed. Now, starting January 15, we plan also to have an afternoon meeting here in the church. The 15th, every second and or every first and third Sabbath, we'll have a meeting here at 4 o'clock. And uh, that's an instructional meeting. The It Is Written has these wonderful videos that help us to develop our talents, how to meet and greet people, how to invite people. Uh, so starting January 15, we plan that afternoon meeting at 4 o'clock, every first and third Sabbath afternoon. It's a time of sharing. I enjoy the sharing part as much as any of it. A lot of experiences out there that... that uh, that we, that we have as we, as we meet people and greet people and invite them to church. And then it's training for gospel outreach. Uh, very possibly in March, we'll have a man by the name of Lonnie Malashenko. How many of you know that name? He was speaker director of the Voice of Prophecy. He's gonna have some meetings here in this church, probably as long as two weeks. So um, think about March, keep it open for some meetings. And, uh, you know, we, we'd encourage you to make an interest list. Uh, we'd like to bring these lists together. We want to invite everybody that, that will to come to these meetings. Uh, and then I, don't want, I want to mention this as well. Sabbath mornings at 8.45, there's a prayer meeting here in this church, in the library. That's 8.45. All are invited to attend. As we approach an evangelistic series, that becomes a very important idea to have a prayer meeting beforehand. We encourage all of you to be a part of the preparation for these meetings. We need everybody on board. Um, all hands on deck as we see the storm approaching. I'd like to encourage you to personal ministry. Out in the foyer, we have a great variety of uh, beautifully uh, crafted 
books and tracts and magazines available. Make yourself available to those. Make them available to you. Give them to your friends, uh, the people you do business with, relatives. Spread them like the leaves of autumn. And uh, if you know of, of some people who used to worship with us, give them a personal visit. We'd love to see them back here, wouldn't we? Yeah. Yes. Uh, perhaps we could each one compile an interest list, addresses and phone numbers, uh, from which we can invite people to the upcoming meetings. Now is the time, now is the time to rebuild God's spiritual temple made up of lively stones. Here are the messages of Haggai and Zechariah, and I would encourage you to spend a little time on those two prophets. Haggai and Zechariah, they came to the builders, to those who had been commissioned to re restore and rebuild Jerusalem and the temple. They came within two months of each other. Haggai's message was, you know, you're enjoying your houses too much. You're building your own houses, but the, but the house of the Lord is going um, unbuilt. And so he calls them to a revival. And Zechariah comes two, week, two, two months later. It's kind of a hard read, but I would encourage you to read at least the first six chapters of Zechariah and spend some time with them. They're really for us who are in, engaged in the, in the process of rebuilding God's temple. These two prophets came at a time when the church needed encouragement. We can take courage. God did not call us to this hour and not have a place for us to perform service for him. Something here for all of us to do with from our hearts. As the events unfold, God will use his people with greater and yet greater efficiency. The message of three angels will have an effect that it never, ever had before. We should be students of the three angels. Do you know that the whole message of the Bible is found in the three angels? You can go through those and you can find everything that we teach and believe. There are several books in the Bible like that too. Book of, Math book of Matthew. You can read the book of Matthew and you can find the whole message of the Bible in that book all the way from end time and great prophecies and, and uh, the abomination that makes desolate, all those things in the book of Matthew, right from, the, right from the mouth of Jesus himself. You know, Jesus was here on the earth for 40 days after he came out of the grave. Wouldn't you like to have heard what he had to say? Yeah, I think we have most of it in the New Testament. And uh, so, I encourage you at the beginning of a new year to spend some time in the Word every day. When you get up in the morning, give yourself to God and make that your very first work. And then spend some time with Him. Develop a prayer life. This is not just a New Year's resolution. This is something we, we need to choose to do, right? We don't make a promise. Promises are broken. They're like ropes of sand. But we can choose. We're, we're, we're people who have the power of choice, right? To spend some time with Jesus every day. My mind is drawn to the fact that God is raising into existence a group of evangelists. We're all called to that work. Out of every nation and language group. And that group is called 144,000. You know, in the first century... Jesus established a church, and he started with how many? Twelve. Twelve of them. They even made up the number in the book of Acts, the first chapter. Twelve evangelists. Twelve is, is a, a very important number. 144,000 is a multiple of twelve. Twelve times twelve is what? 144,000. These 144,000, you know, they're, they're talked about in... In, in Matthew chapter 14, verses 1 to 5, right? You find them there. Their character is all that written there. And then the next verses, the first, the first, second, third angel's messages tell how they got that way. 
That's a very close relationship. The 144,000 have that message to carry to the world. And the end result of all of that will be a multitude which no man can number. What will it be like to stand on the sea of glass and see a multitude which no man can number? All the result of the final gospel outreach. And uh, Revelation 14 is all about that. Uh, The latter rain. Pray for the latter rain in the time of the latter rain. Zechariah 10, verse 1. So what should, we be, 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 what should we be praying for this morning and throughout the week? Pray for the latter rain, right? <laughs> if we pray for the latter rain, the former rain will do its work, right? If we're really in earnest about that. And there will be some sealing take place when, when that happens. And the 144,000 will be a great teaching body initiating the greatest gospel outreach that's ever been seen since the world began. A people made ready for the advent. Way ahead of my notes. A climax to all of this is found in Revelation chapter 18. I'd like to invite you to turn to Revelation 18. Verses 1 to 4. Revelation 18, verses 1 to 4. We have called this the loud cry. The final warning message to the world of three angels. I want to read Revelation 18, verses 1 to 5, actually. And after these things, I saw another angel. What does angel mean? Messenger. messenger. Okay, this is a heavenly messenger. Come down from heaven, having great power. And the earth was what? Lightened with his glory. <laughs> you know, there are several words in the Bible. Life, light, truth. You can take those words and interchange them in any Bible text and you don't change the meaning of the text. We're looking for the precious light. The earth is to be lightened with the glory of God. What is the glory of God? It's his character, right? <laughs> Remember Moses said, Lord, I want to see your glory. And what did the Lord answer him? I have caused my goodness to pass before you, right? God is good. Is he good? Amen. Say amen. amen. How often is he good? All the time. God is good. The earth is lightened with his character, right? You know, the last message of mercy to go to the world will be a revelation of what? His character. The earth is, still needs to hear about that. They don't know that God is good. In fact, as I go down the street and go from here and there and around, and I see people, they're not, they're not smiling. There's not, not much to smile about right now, right? What with COVID and all those different things. But for those who believe in Jesus, there's something to smile about. The earth is yet going to be lightened with the glory of God. The character of God will be known. That last message of mercy to the world. And people will be making decisions. There will be no fence sitters in that day. You know, right now there are three groups of people. There are people who believe. People who don't believe. And there are people who say, I don't know. It's for that group that this message goes forth to the world. And we're trying to find those. Verse 2, Revelation 18, verse 2. And he cried mightily. How's he crying? Mightily. mightily. With a strong voice saying, Babylon, the great has fallen, has fallen, has become the habitation of what? Devils. Devils. Uh, the margin of my Bible says demons. And the whole of every foul spirit and a cage of every unclean and hateful bird. For, the, for all nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. And the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her. Actually, this is a union of church and state that's being spoken of here again. What happened during the 1260 years when there was a union of church and state and forcing people to, to believe so, so and so and taking away all the Bibles, this is going to happen again. A union of church and state, a grand union of church and state. It says, verse 3, 
For all nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication, and the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her. It's an illicit union. What happens when a church has the power of the state behind it? Persecution ensues, right? And uh, this is all coming again. And the merchants of the earth have waxed, waxed rich through the abundance of her delicacies. Verse 4, And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people. Where do you think the majority of God's people are today? In Babylon. What does Babylon mean? Confusion. It's in the confusion that's going on everywhere. Come out of her, my people. Whose people are they? They're his people, right? He came and died for them. He paid the price. He paid the price for all of us. I guess the question we should ask ourselves, did he make a good investment? Come out of her, my people, that ye be part, not partakers of her sins, and that ye receive not of her plagues. Verse 5. For her sins have reached to heaven, and God hath remembered her iniquities. When is it that uh, her sins have reached to heaven? It has to do with God's law and the making void of God's law. That's why there's so much lawlessness in the world today. It's because God's law has been forgotten. So there's the final message to the world. The message of God's character. The devil has a program that's powerful. But greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Right. Notice with me another text, Revelation 17. Back just uh, to the left a little bit before we were. Revelation chapter 17, verse 14. I just love reading this text. Gives me a lot of comfort. It says, uh, well, verse, let's do verse 13 and 14. These have one mind and will give their power and strength to the beast. These shall make war with the lamb. Who's that? The word lamb is used 22 times in the book of Revelation. And in all but one time, it refers to Jesus Christ. They shall make war with the lamb, and the lamb shall overcome them. For he is Lord of lords and King of kings, and they that are with him are what? Called and chosen and faithful. Who might those people be? Every believer. Every believer in Jesus. So the Lord is looking for people today. The Lamb shall overcome them. No room for doubt here. What a prophetic promise that can be for each of us. The fulfillment of God's side in Revelation 14. These three angel prophecies, three angel messages are just as certain as Jesus himself. That means that we can't possibly fail in carrying out the gospel commission given to the church by Jesus himself. According to my understanding of Matthew 24, the Bible prophecy is not so much about predicting the future as it is about recognizing the future when it happens. And uh, when we uh, see the prophecies unfold, our faith in the testimony of Jesus will be vindicated. But we have to read it and see it before it happens so that our faith can be vindicated. Spend some time every day in the Word in this new year. Prophecy gives us courage for tomorrow and the next day and the next day after that in this new year. One day at a time. I'm, go I'm, I'm going to tell you these things, said Jesus to disciples, so that when they happen, you'll believe that I am who I say I am. Many years ago, maybe 35 years ago, I was driving home from Holbrook Mission School in Arizona, northern Arizona. Some, how many of you have been to Holbrook? Yeah, we're living in Arizona. It's an interesting place to visit. There's a mission school there, and I spent a little time there. And, 
And we were traveling home. It was in the Christmas season. It's about the time of the year that we're living in right now. And um, in the southern Utah and northern Arizona, the winters can be very, very cold and hard. In fact, in southern Utah, sometimes the snow is pretty heavy. And it was a dark, snowy night in December. I was uh, traveling along in a 19... 83 Ford Thunderbird. I don't know if some of you know what that is. <laughs> uh, Thunderbirds are not very popular now anymore, but uh, this is a nice little car, but it was a street car. Hardly a snow car. And the mountains in southern Utah were being inundated with snow, and as I drive, drove along the highway that night, I never saw snow come down so hard and so steady as that night. There was a little design flaw in the 83 Thunderbird. It had the headlight, right? And just in front of the headlight, there was a little shelf. And as I was driving along, the snow was kind of coming down toward me. Snow would build up on that little shelf. And it would make the lights dimmer and dimmer. And I couldn't see. So about every five minutes, I'd have to jump out of the car, go out there, take my fingers, and scoop the snow off that little ledge so that I could see. And... Uh, Finally, it became so almost impossible to see the edge of the road. And um, I knew that if I should veer off, I'd possibly spend the night out there in the ditch. So I felt hopelessly trapped in the deep snow. And it was likely that no one was as foolish as I driving along on that night. <laughs> Everybody was stayed home by the fireplace, and especially in a streetcar. Very thoughtless preparation. Can we make a spiritual application here? <laughs> Mixed with ignorance of the danger. My knuckles were white as I gripped the steering wheel. I was wide awake at 20 miles an hour. I was praying, and my great concern was for my family who were with me in the car. Five of them. And then I saw it. In my rearview mirror, I saw a little glow. A set of headlights coming up behind me. I think that the visibility was about one football field at that, at that time in the evening. An older four-wheel drive Ford pickup. <laughs> I just love it. <laughs> he came up behind me and he passed me with great confidence as he drove along. What do you think I did? <laughs> I could see those tracks, and I followed right in his footsteps. He seemed to know exactly where the road was, and I got in his tracks, and I stayed there. It didn't take long for me to stop and jump out, maybe 15 seconds, get the, lead, the snow off the ledge, and get back in my car again and catch up with him, because I didn't want him to get out of my sight. I didn't, I didn't lose him. It was like a lamp to my feet, a light to my path. I followed him until I could see the glow of a little village coming up in, ahead of me. I didn't see that pickup again. I didn't have an opportunity to thank him. But I did lift my eyes to heaven and gave thanks to the one from whom all blessings flow. That's what Bible prophecy should be to us. A light in a dark place in a stormy world. That's where we are today. Revelation is not a terror to the believer in Jesus. But indeed, it's the testimony of Jesus who is the light of the world. I guess our challenge this morning would be, could we covenant with him today and allow him to be our strong tower. You know, he, in the, one of the Psalms it says he is our strong tower. The righteous runs into it and finds refuge. Uh, a place where we can run into and be safe from the storm. I'd like to invite you today in a new year. 
Renew your commitment to Jesus. Your love for him will result in in an experience maybe that you haven't experienced before. A new year. 2000, what's, what is the new year? 22, 2022. Wow, I didn't think I'd live this long. And um, we might renew our commitment to an unfinished task. The gospel has not yet gone to all the world but I believe it's getting close. I don't know just how close, but when the gospel goes to all the world, what's gonna happen? The end will come. The world doesn't wanna hear that word end, but Jesus said it. And uh, I think it's happening much faster than we, than we, when we first believed. I'd like to, in closing, invite you to turn with me to 1 Thessalonians chapter five. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Comes there just before Hebrews and Timothy. We all know what 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 is about, don't we? It's about the second coming. And 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 is all about how to be ready for his coming. Actually, that whole chapter, I would, I would suggest it and recommend it for a af- Sabbath afternoon read. Chapter five, chapter 5, the whole chapter. It has things in it like pray without ceasing. Think that's a good idea? Uh, despise not prophesying. I just want to read the first 11 verses. 1 Thessalonians 5, verses 1 to 11. I want to just leave this with, in our consciousness this, this morning. It says, but of the times and season, brethren, ye have no need that I write unto you. <laughs> you know, it must have been that way in that first century world too. He didn't need to tell them what, what the times and seasons were like. It was all, all over. Wickedness was rife again by, the, by, by 60 AD. For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night. For when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them as travail upon a woman with child and they shall not escape. Verse four, I like the way this is put. But you, brethren, are not in darkness, right? That the day should overtake, that that day should overtake you as a thief. Ye are the children of light and the children of the day. We are not in the night nor of the darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. For they that sleep, sleep in the night. They that be drunken are drunken in the night. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and for a helmet the hope of salvation. For God hath not appointed us to to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. Wherefore, comfort yourselves together and edify one another, even as also you do. So uh, I just want to leave that with you. That's our appeal. That's the appeal that the Apostle Paul left for us. And uh, I guess we could just say this, even so come Lord Jesus. Shall we pray? Dear Father in heaven, thank you again for the great reassurance and promise that you've made in your book, your holy book for our benefit. You came here, Lord, on a long and dangerous journey a long time ago, and you're still with us, and you're there wherever we need you. We praise you, Lord, as our great high priest now in heavenly places, one who bestows the blessings of life and strength and a sound mind. This morning, I pray that you will be with each of us in a very special way as we enter a new and uncertain year. I pray that you bless each one here according to our needs. And I pray these things in Jesus' name, amen.